How many of you out there grew up playing games on home computers? And I don't mean on nice Super VGA setups with Creative Labs wavetable sound cards. Oh no, that, that was for people that actually had money. You know, maybe it was your friend whose dad was a doctor or lawyer, something like that. Oh no, no, I, I'm talking about home computers where 256 color palettes were a pipe dream at best, and you had sound coming out of a PC speaker that resembled a Pong arcade machine from the 70s. You know, the type of computer that would take a full five minutes to load into a title screen, allowing you to start the game, which then required you to wait another five full minutes before being able to actually do anything. Well, if you happen to miss that era or just grew up on consoles completely, there's a chance that there's some classic titles and entire series of games out there that you've never played or experienced. And note, when I say classic there, I am referring to it more in the sense that it's cool because it's old, not cool because it's something that you actually would want to mess with every day. Not unlike a Edsel citation with Teletouch Transmission. However, I should probably pause for a second because I'm sure that there's some of you out there that don't know me and are thoroughly confused as to why I'm talking about a Ford vanity project and old computers when the title of the video shares its name with Steven Spielberg's professional directorial debut, Duel from 1971. Sorry, this is not a movie review channel. Yet. Hi, my name is Dave, and welcome to Zalagamoto, the channel where rather than try to discuss Spielberg films that aren't related to Harrison Ford or abysmally awful books, I'm actually instead out to collect and review the nearly 1,280 titles released in the English language for the Sega Master System, Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega or Mega CD as the case may be, and finally the 32X. Basically, if I can plug it into a Genesis either by itself or with some sort of add-on and be able to read what's on the screen, I'm trying to get a copy of it and review it for posterity, with both looks at that original packaging and gameplay captured from original hardware whenever possible. Now that you're up to speed, how does that intro connect to today's video? Well, the game of the hour is The Duel, Test Drive 2 for the Genesis, which came to the console in all of its unlicensed glory in March of 1992. Now, you're probably familiar with the Test Drive series of games because even though the original publisher Accolade has long since been out of business, the rights to the Test Drive name live on, with over 20 games bearing the Test Drive name in some form hitting the market in the 37 years since the original Test Drive hit the market back in 1987. The first three games in the Test Drive series all appeared on various home computers in a three-year span from 1987 to 1990. And just to tie things back to the introduction, if you didn't play those games on a computer, you never would have experienced any of those titles, at least when they were first released. However, with Accolade slowly working their way into the console sphere, they needed titles. And rather than just rely on licensed ports like Double Dragon or Super Off-Road, they decided to dip back into their already established IP and tag Distinctive Software Incorporated with the responsibility of porting the duel to the Genesis. So was DSi able to work some magic and improve upon a game that they had already released three years earlier? Or do we now have an even more flawed version of an already relatively early racing game? Well, we shall see, but first a look at the package. Okay, and this is my copy of The Duel Test Drive 2 for the Genesis. Being one of the earlier Accolade releases for the console, this goes back to when Accolade was still doing things on their own and utilizing cardboard boxes that were much more similar to what you would expect to see on home computers instead of on the Genesis. One of the nice things about these boxes is that even though they weren't the plastic clamshells, they were still sturdier than what Electronic Arts or Sega used when they went the cardboard box route, so they tend to hold up better over the years. As you can pretty quickly see by looking at the cover, this is not the original release of the game. This is the re-release version that came out a little bit later. There's no real difference between the versions other than the original cover art has been shrunk down and placed in an inset, and instead you now have the video game classics labeling at the top and then the two-toned checkerboard background. I'm pretty certain that all of the early Accolade cardboard box releases got this treatment, excluding Ashido, of course, which was its own thing, 
And depending on the game, sometimes it seems like the original release is more rare, and then sometimes this video game classics version is harder to find. But for the Duel, they both seem to be about the same, and getting a copy of either with manual is going to run you between $20 and $25. Possibly more if you're a true completionist and want to find one with the poster that was originally included. Personally, while I prefer the non-video game classics versions, this copy is complete with everything except that poster, as you'll see in a minute, so I'm good with holding on to it. As far as that front cover goes, like other Accolade releases, there was no Japanese version, and Accolade used the same art for both the North American and European releases, so there's not a whole lot to discuss here other than what we've already covered. The cover art is okay. It's a top-down view of a Ferrari F40 and a Porsche 959, two of the three cars in the game, that are going at it, dueling, if you will. It's not bad, but certainly not on the level of some of the Boris Vallejo art used for other Accolade titles. And to be perfectly honest, I prefer the art that was used on the original home computer version, which has a picture of an unfortunate 959 that's getting left in the dust, there's just something classy and understated about that original cover. Flipping over the back, and this is a pretty solid layout with four decent pictures from the game, including a pretty cool shot of the other car that's included in the game, the classic Lamborghini Diablo. I especially like the bullet points that hype up each of the cars, although it's really interesting how times have changed with the F40 boasting 478 horsepower something that even regular schmucks these days can get in an above-average sports car. One other note, I really appreciate Accolade boasting about the amount of megabits in the cartridge on the back and not taking away from the front cover. Opening up the package, and while I don't have the poster, I do have the warranty card and an advertising card for Super Off-Road and Double Dragon. Funny how those two came up again. Along with the manual. The manual is well written, but not bloated, as the game is fully detailed, but with it being a relatively simple racing game, there's not too much that really needs to be explained. I do find it interesting that they had to include a kilometers to miles per hour chart, with the explanation being that these are all European cars, so for accuracy's sake, the speedometers are shown in kilometers per hour, which of course most Americans wouldn't necessarily be familiar with, especially back in 1992. Okay, that's the package. Let's do some racing, and apparently try to avoid the cops while we're at it. Test Drive 2, as I'm going to refer to it for the rest of the review, is a throwback to a time when games, especially home computer games, were simpler. This makes more sense when you think about how the game originally first appeared on home computers in March of 1989, long before the Genesis even existed in the United States and is the direct sequel of the original test drive, which goes all the way back to late 1987. Back then, when you played games on home computers, you may or may not have had silly things like joysticks and sound cards, or even had hard drives in most cases, depending on the type of computer. So games had to be simpler. Having said that, the original release of Test Drive 2 was a bit different than what would eventually appear on the Genesis three years later and more different still than the Super Nintendo version, but I won't be focusing on that too much. The dual surname to Test Drive 2 originally was more impactful, as that home computer version only featured two cars, the Ferrari F40 and the Porsche 959. Legally licensed properties and games weren't as prevalent back then, as I've covered in numerous sports games on the channel, and more specifically in the review of Jaguar XJ220 for the Sega CD back in episode 199 which famously featured the title car, and then a bunch of cars that kinda sorta looked like real life cars, but had fake names to keep up the illusion that they weren't those actual vehicles. Even though only two cars were included, which admittedly seems prehistoric these days with franchises like Forza and Gran Turismo having rosters numbering in the hundreds, it was a big deal back then to not have just one, but two real life cars in the game with fans of each manufacturer being able to race them against one another for bragging rights as to who had the best car. However, not only was the car roster simpler in the original version of the game, the proving grounds, so to speak, that you could race on were simpler as well, with the home computer version of Test Drive 2 only having one track to race on that was made up of multiple segments, 
As you can imagine, no matter how good of a game Test Drive 2 was at the time, with only one course to learn and only two possible cars to use, the content left a little bit to be desired. This is where the home computer versions got a boost from the original DLC, in the form of add-on discs sold to expand the game. Computers that could support the additional content had the option of purchasing four add-ons, with two granting the player additional cars to choose from, and two adding one course each, giving the player up to three courses to race on, and a pretty impressive 12 real-life cars to burn rubber in. I mention all this because the Genesis version is sort of an amalgam of that original Test Drive 2 and some of the additional content that was produced for it. Even though the courses aren't labeled the same way, out of the box the Genesis has a similar three course layout, with one course consisting of seven stages and then two others having six. Unfortunately from a car perspective, Genesis players weren't quite so lucky. Rather than having the 12 cars allotted to the original full version of the game, the Genesis version only had three. It's too bad to be sure, but considering licensing requirements, it makes sense that Accolade couldn't pony up more cash to include more cars in the game. Like the original game, the Genesis version still features that Ferrari F40 and Porsche 959, but also added a third car in the Lamborghini Diablo, which had just made its debut for the public in January of 1990. One car certainly can't match 10, but to Accolade's credit, at least they were giving console gamers a new option that didn't appear in the original version of the game. Okay, so we've established that Genesis owners have three very real cars with very real statistics displayed in the game to help players make their choice of what car they want to use, and that they have three different courses now that they can race on. But what do those races actually consist of? And how much actual dueling is there really going on here? I'll come back to that dueling aspect in a second, but as mentioned, each of the three courses is split up into different stages. And just to be clear, in the Genesis version, the courses are listed by scenery rather than geographic location, with city, mountain, and desert being the options. However, having these courses split up into segments may not be exactly what arcade fans are expecting as instead, they function a lot more like segments do in rally racing. When you play a game like OutRun or Hang On, it's expected that the course is one long contiguous track, and the different segments really only exist to keep you moving as you race against the clock. Not so in Test Drive 2. Here, the game operates a little more like Road Rash, where each segment has a specific beginning and end, with each segment having different lengths and of course varying turns and even speed limits. More on that in a bit. In an element that's uniquely test drive, at the end of each segment, you actually can't just floor it and cross the finish line. You actually have to be paying attention as you're required to stop at the local gas station to avoid running out of gas, which will then incur a time penalty if you happen to miss the station. I'm sure there's those of you out there that wouldn't like this and think that the drivers should just be able to go flat out, but I like it because it forces players to make pit stops, just like in other types of racing. Now, should these supercars run out of gas after only traveling a few miles? Well, no, of course, and while I don't doubt that they might have mile per gallon ratings in the single digits, they aren't that bad. However, we have to have some suspension of disbelief here. I mean, it is a video game after all. Just as an aside, one of my favorite bits about the game is how each gas station has a different name and theme. It's a small detail, but sometimes those small details make all the difference. Just racing on a predefined course to get the best time would be too simple though, so Accolade and DSi have thrown a few curveballs in here. First is that dual nature of the game. When setting up a race, you can pick which of the three cars you want to race against, controlled by the computer, or just race against the clock, although I'm not sure why you'd ever do that. As you progress through the race and make it to each checkpoint, you'll get an update of how you're doing against your opponent time-wise, and then of course the times are cumulative, so even if you have a bad segment, you still have a chance to come out on top overall. Depending on the difficulty level, the computer opponent will be better or a worse driver, and serves as a nice way to push yourself to get better. Also, something that I really appreciate, the computer follows the same rules as you do, meaning that if the computer wrecks, blows their engine, or misses their pit stop, 
they get the same time penalties that you do. And this allows for another unique element, where you can technically use up all your lives, you start with five, and have the game tell you that you've died, which is pretty dramatic, I must say, but then you could still technically win if you got further than the computer. Bizarre, but like the different gas stations, it's a small detail that I really like, and I can't say that I've seen before anywhere else. However, it's not enough to be racing against one other driver, oh no. No, instead, in another very road rash adjacent design, you're up against not only other run-of-the-mill drivers that are just out running errands or doing whatever it is they're doing, but also the local police that show up from time to time. While the opposing traffic is made up of unlicensed vehicles, if you look closely, you can definitely pick out other cars that at least resemble BMW sedans and what appear to be Ford Thunderbirds in an oddly specific decision. Uh, and note, I could totally be wrong about that, but as someone that was a fan of NASCAR in the late 80s and the early 90s, there's definitely a strong resemblance to that Thunderbird nose. Ultimately though, it doesn't matter what else is out there, as your only job is to avoid those other cars whenever possible, as even the smallest fender bender will see you losing a life. This makes up the bulk of the game, as the cops are actually somewhat of a non-factor. Your car is armed with a radar detector to at least give you a heads up to slow down if you don't want any unwanted attention, but the speed limits are such that you're really better off just blowing through areas as quick as possible. This also leads to an explanation as to why the miles per hour, kilometers per hour chart was included in the manual, because while all the cars have kilometers per hour on the speedometer, the speed limit signs are in miles per hour, which means that you get to do math while you're racing as well, if you're trying to sneak past the cops. It seems like there had to be a better way to handle this, like maybe having the speed limit signs in KPH instead, but like I said, it's best to just pretend that you're in the cannonball run and deal with those consequences later. The graphics in game are, if I'm going to be honest, a little disappointing. They're not terrible, but you're forced into a cockpit view of the road, meaning that really only a small portion of the screen is dedicated to what's in front of you and what's out there that you're trying to avoid. Also, it becomes pretty clear why that is quickly as the frame rate is on the low end, and I'm sure the Genesis wouldn't be able to handle a bigger view area without just completely slowing to a crawl. The feel that I got from the game is, Test Drive 2 is what hard drive and erase driving seems like they would look like if they didn't suck. Which is, honestly says more about how bad those two games are versus Test Drive 2 being good necessarily. It's not all bad, as the Genesis version definitely appears to be more detailed than other versions, and it runs about as well as the Amiga and Atari ST versions from a frame rate perspective. Now, full disclosure, if you really want a nicer frame rate, you probably would want to look at that Super Nintendo version, which is very smooth, but at least based on what I saw, seemed blander and just not nearly as appealing. From a sound perspective, there's good and bad here. The good is that the game contains three separate tracks for background music that can be chosen before you go to race, very similar to OutRun. Each of the tracks is good in their own way, and while I wouldn't say that any of them are amazing, they get the job done. The only problem is, once you pick a track before you go to race, you're stuck with that music for the entirety of the race, unless you just go into the options screen and turn off music. I think I would have preferred the game to just automatically switch tracks between each segment of the race, and that way you're only hearing each bit of music for a few minutes at a time, rather than like, 20 but it's not the end of the world. On the other hand, the sound effects leave a bit to be desired. The engine noise is fine, but other than that, there's just not a whole lot going on other than the occasional screeching of tires or the siren when a cop comes after you. If you're gonna do the version comparison thing again, I would say the Genesis version does have the best sound out of any of the versions, as, and I could be wrong, but it appears the Super Nintendo version doesn't have any in-race music and the sound effects are definitely better on the Genesis than they are on the Amiga or the Atari ST. The Dual Test Drive 2 ended up being a lot more fun than I had any expectations for, especially with it essentially being a game from 1989. 
problem is that the Genesis version didn't come out in 1989. It came out in 1992. And by that point, a game that clearly took inspiration from Test Drive 2 and Road Rash had already been on the console for six months. And then Road Rash 2, one of the games that most people think is one of the best on the console, was lurking and would be available by the end of the year. All this leaves Test Drive 2 in a weird spot, as with better racing games being available, who was Test Drive 2 really for? The Test Drive fans that had already played it on home computer and just wanted it in console form? Or maybe kids that loved supercars and wanted the ability to drive a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a Porsche, regardless of what the rest of the package looked like. Ultimately, I do like Test Drive 2, with all its small details, like, say, being able to blow your engine and lose a life if you're careless about shifting, something that I don't think I've ever seen in another racing game, even to this day. But it's a game that really needed to come out before it did, like, say, maybe in 1990 instead of 1992. And because of that, I'm giving the duel, Test Drive 2, a matching two stars. If you like racing games, I would definitely play this and try it out, but don't be surprised if you're going to move on to something else relatively quickly. Okay, and that is it for the Dual Test Drive 2 on the Genesis. You know, it's funny sometimes, when I do these reviews, I realize little things that are completely insignificant, but once they come up, they end up taking up far more time in your head than they should. For instance, on these shelves behind me, should the Dual Test Drive 2 be alphabetized with the D's for Dual, or should it be in the T's for Test Drive 2? Accolade could have saved everyone a lot of heartache on that one by simply naming the game Test Drive 2 the Dual instead, but no, and now I've got to get the Dewey Decimal System or the Library of Congress involved or something. <sighs> Next time on Zalgamoto, you know what, let's do something completely different and cover a game that I'm pretty sure that I've never even mentioned over the last five and a half years or so. And honestly, part of that is due to the fact that I don't think I even knew it existed until after I started the channel, and I was starting to look for games that were a little bit harder to find. This one is a European exclusive Mega Drive game. Yes, that's right, Mega Drive, not Master System. But curiously, it involves a very American IP. I guess we'll find out if it's a picnic or perhaps a boo-boo in the console library. Well, that's it for Zalagamoto episode 240. If you like what you saw here and want to see more, please think about liking and subscribing if you're so inclined, as it will help more people see these videos. But most importantly, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!